So we've just had a chat with Edenshaw and he did tell us to find the seven statues. He needs to perform some kind of ritual or something like that. Um, now that we've got some weapons, I may actually go and equip the shotgun. Triple barrel shotgun. Just in case I get into a little bit of trouble out here. Ah, there is something. Whew. Okay, that's one down. Just gonna hang on to this shotgun and watch out for more monsters. Okay, let's have a look around here. There's another mirror. And this mirror has one of the ornaments missing. Okay, a couple of books around here as well. I can't seem to read these ones though. Uh oh. I just heard a door open. So there's gotta be some lights. There's gotta be a light switch around here somewhere. Ah, there it is. Okay, things don't look so bad with the lights on. <laughs> this must be the front door as well. Um, it seems to be sealed up though. There's no getting through there. I'm just gonna have a quick look around and see if there's anything else. There's a box of uh, shotgun shells there. Okay. Oh, reload. Oh, no, no, no. Whew. Okay, I think I need a uh, first aid kit after that. I'm sure these lights were on earlier. Drats! <laughs> Had to reload! Zombies! Oh, goodness me. There's another one down here as well. Luckily they're pretty slow, but that one was just right by the door. Okay, still got quite a few shotgun shells here. There we go, looks like they take three shots each. Hanging in that closet. I might just leave it there. Something on this, uh, this cabinet here. Oh, I'm nearing our goal. Um, some incompre incomprehensible writing there. Alan is so impatient. What passion and what madness. Clarity must sometimes live in darkness, for from darkness light may spring. It appears that the ritual must take place upon a precise date. Inheritors, guardians, rituals, gate, danger. I never cease to be amazed by the richness of this language. I pity those fools who could only look on me and mock. Where do these transcriptions of Grandpa Jeremy come from? Where did he find the inscriptions? Why did he never take me into his confidence? Alan has come up with an incredible theory. I must find out if it's true. Water from a deep source revives the man who thinks he's dead. Water from a deep source. Alan was right, again, I know he will always be better than me. As the text takes shape, its revelations become more terrifying. Beyond this threshold, the sun has never shone. He who has crossed it has never returned. This gate was built by man from firestone, so that the shadows would always dwell in night. Man sealed this gate with his blood, as the gods did order him. Man has not conquered the shadow. The gate brings no victory, it merely chokes the flow, a curse, on he who opens it once more. My god, what are we doing? The last witch doctor will destroy the world of darkness. May humanity forgive us. Okay. 
We've got some shells over here. So it sounds like Alan, possibly Obed, want to open the gate. And the Wish Doctor is trying to stop them. This mirror seems to be cracked. There's a scroll here? Did I have a look at that? No, that's... Okay, that's the one I read already, but there's another book over here. Let me just check this one out. Abkhani's Amerindians, a link between two humanities. This book is the result of research that I embarked upon more than 20 years ago. I'm aware that the theories, ideas, and truths expounded herein have already engendered great hostility, not only from my colleagues, but also from anthropological and ethnological scientists who are more distantly related to my field. I know that history will prove me right. It is this conviction that drives me onwards on this narrow, treacherous path. I've chosen to take. My passion for Abkhani's culture, language, and civilization started at a very young age. I owe this passion to two men. Firstly, to my grandfather, Jeremy Morton, who was a physician, mathematician, astronomer, philosopher, and magician, as well as a misunderstood genius. By the will of God, may mankind one day pay him the homage that is his due. Secondly, to Joseph Edenshaw, who entered my grandfather's service in 1920. He may have been my tutor, but he was like a father to me. He may have been my master, but he was also my faithful servant. To my knowledge, he is the last living representative of the great Abkhani civilization. He is still alive, apparently. I am deeply grateful to them both. May, may Hecatonchias bathe them both with his sweet eternal life. My detractors have often reproached me for elaborating the theories from which my convictions spring on the basis of limited, fragmentary, and unreliable sources. It is true to say that up until now the material I have provided to feed my critics' curiosity is scant. Three engraved stones and several dozen photos of inscriptions taken from the walls of grottoes found on an island off the coast of Boston. Champollion, however, persuaded the world of his convictions with only the Rosetta Stone. On the basis of my evidence, I can confirm that a highly evolved form of Abkhani civilization with a complex writing system appeared in the northeast of what is now the United States 15,000 years ago. This civilization has a rich history that is more extensive than even our Judeo-Christian civilization. Unlike other human civilizations, it, is, it never sought to extend its territories to conquer others or migrate. It should not be forgotten in this respect that the word Abkhanis itself means guardian in their language. Since my first publications on the subject appeared in certain specialist reviews of limited circulation, articles have appeared which claim the Abkhanis are the descendants of a race of extraterrestrial origin. This discredited my research greatly, and I feel compelled to say that such rantings are completely unfounded. The Abkhanis are anything but extraterrestrials. Abkhani society was not organized around the family unit, but on a community structure. From the age of 12, Abkhanis men and women both embark without sexual discrimination on the same initiation rituals which last 12 long years. At the end of their initiation, they are accorded the status of guardian. It is at this point that different religious, military, and household functions are attributed. The Abkhanis were cave dwellers, however their religion was not based on fire but on light. They developed an elaborate pantheon of divinities, which became the cornerstone of their daily life. The magic of light. Ancient Abkhanis' religious worship was expressed through a set of different magical rituals in which light was central. It also appears that their designated enemies were forms of demons from hell that they called Drakar, Ani, or creatures of darkness. It is probable that this marvelous Abkhani's writing system, the deciphering of which I am still grappling with today, was perfected to determine specific roles for each ritual. Many questions remain unanswered, in particular how their writing operated. For most known civilizations, writing was first invented for commercial exchange, for listing possessions, or for establishing contracts. The Abkhani's one single preoccupation, however, seems to have been their role as guardian. Guardian of what, though? And against whom? These are both questions to which I think I will never find satisfactory answers. Whew! Okay, so quite a lot of reading there, and uh, it's a feature of these games that there's always a fair bit to read. Quite a few books scattered around the place. I'm going to use a revolver here. There's a mirror over here. Let's take a look at it. This mirror seems to be cracked. Right, I'm going to stand back. Take a few shots at it. And uh, we found another book inside. The words are like spears, like light, lightning, bringing great rolls of thunder. 
They emanate from the mouths of the gods themselves, you witch doctor. You read them, beware. The danger they conceal is far greater than the power you desire. The terrible anger of the great Hecatonchias will rain down on any usurper. Know this, witch doctor, that this language was passed down by your father. From your father's father and beyond, it is your flesh, it is your blood. Your duty is to serve the humankind in its battle against the shadows of the night. The ritual to open the gate can only be accomplished during the 18th cycle of the moon. Witch doctor, you will need to invoke the seven names of the seven gods of light. Hecatonchias, Gilgamesh, Uphanos, Anticoalt, Heliopana, Melacanth, Hemicles. Then observe the flight of the children of the sky. If their wings beat the air, renounce the ritual for only great sorrow shall come of it. If they hold their wings in the currents, however, prepare yourselves for the longest night of your life. Pure and fearless of spirit, you must stand before the gate. Here, invoke the gods of light one last time and then kneel down. Proclaim clearly these sacred words. Okay. And prepared thyself for the final combat. Okay, so that's... Looks like some writing to... Uh, the Indian on how to perform the ritual. I should go back to see Lucy Morton. Okay. Oh, oh, do we have some enemies here? The lights have turned off. Quick run. Whew. And uh, we've been taken straight back to the bedroom. I should, I guess, put away my gun. Let's go and put that away and have a chat with uh, Lucy. So... Have you seen Obed? Unfortunately, I think so. I don't know what's going on. Does Obed have enemies? What has he done that everyone hates him so? And why didn't you tell me that you had another son? Alan, that horrid beast is my son no longer. We have very little hope left. Our family bears a dark secret, young lady, and Alan is the cause of it. Obed gave me this here. A glass prism. I know too well what it is. Oh, oh, poor Howard. What have I done to deserve this hell? You must ask yourself the very same question, young lady. You did not end up here by chance. If the Lord allows you to escape, shed some light on your own life. You were born out of a misdeed, and you are paying for that sin. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know better than I do. Enough. Leave me now. I'm weary and wish to sleep. Besides, all in all, I find you very unpleasant. Hmm. Very well. Okay. Okay, just gonna head through this door here. This door on the left. Oh gosh. That was close. Too close. So I'm going to try to use the projector, which means uh, I should turn off the turn off the light. So I think I've got everything that I need. I'm gonna use the the prism. Let's place that in there. And then use the torch. Why did you try and stop me in my path, Father? You mustn't struggle against your fate. But you won't have died in vain. Your body is about to experience a new birth. The darkness blending into your blood will make you a stronger being. You will be faster. You will be a complete being. Oh, marvelously complete. First injection. Farewell, Father. Second injection. Welcome, new man. And we've been given this kind of uh, cube here as well. 
So that's what I thought was happening. They were turning these people into like zombie creatures. Um, I think just out there there was a, a, a hound, wasn't there? So I'm going to grab the... Well, I'll reload this. And I'll equip the, uh, the shotgun. Um, I actually need to use one of these again. Let's use that. A small engraved metal cube. It is engraved library 3D map. There's a star on part of it and the numbers 1991. Okay. So I guess I need to head to the library then. I'm not sure if that hound was still there, but I'm not going to wait around to find out. Oh gosh! No! Whew. This is crazy! Oh, there's still nine of them there, right? No, no! Whew. Why are they so close to the door? Right, let's use... Hopefully I can find some more. Uh, I might as well just reload that while I'm here. Oh, goodness me. Whew, that was close. So I found my way into the library. Let's just put that away for now. Have a little bit of a look around. Something on the desk. Something on the pedestal over here, and uh, something on the floor. There's a box of something. Box of grenades. Okay, let's read this book on the pedestal uh, first of all. Wow, there's a lot to read. Okay, Richard Morton back from an exploration in front of one of his ships. Okay, hopefully it's just photos and things. Richard Morton. The history of the famous Boston dynasty is a tale full of unexplained events, surprises and troubles. Some will claim my only goal in telling it is to damage the reputation of one of the most legendary fortunes of Massachusetts. I would like to say in my defense that I am simply doing my duty as a historian. My account is based on reliable sources and interviews with witnesses who, though they may be evasive, are no less worthy of our interest. If I echo certain rumors, it is in the belief that they too are constitutive of the Morton family history. Uh, Morton Oil Company, okay, in Venezuela, sure. Contract for the exploitation of natural resources in Puebla, Venezuela, signed by a representative of the Venezuelan government and by Richard Morton. The Morton family roots in America go back to the time of the great demographic changes during the decades following the, fund, uh, the founding of the USA, although it is impossible to reconstruct the family history further back than the beginning of the 19th century. It appears that the family originated from the small town of Whitechapel in Sussex, England. It was Robert Morton, a linen merchant who led his family to the American continent in 1823. He built his first paper factory on the heights of Beacon Hill. The success of Morton Papers was dazzling. It was Richard Morton, though, his older brother, who founded the real Morton Empire by creating the Morton Oil Company. Okay, the Ice Man. The Morton family's history of secrecy started with the discovery of a man in the ice during one of the company's prospecting expeditions in Greenland between uh, 91 and 93. Richard Morton, the influential public figure, became increasingly reclusive, abandoning the powerful Boston society circles he frequented to launch himself into daring expeditions that led him back, time after time, to the site of his first Mac of a discovery. Deserto is in the background. Uh, yeah, we've dealt with the ghost of Deserto. To assist in his missions, which sometimes ended in human and financial disasters, he called upon Swedish and Norwegian sailors and mercenaries, among who was certain Judas de Serto. De Serto was a risk taker, a warrior, and a clairvoyant, interested in the arts of black magic. He was, a, he was a suspicious character who seemed to have great influence over Richard Morton. The exact cause of this terrible accident was never uncovered. Looks like a train has been derailed. Against expectations, the family business was flourishing. The Morton Oil Company won over market after market in Venezuela, Indonesia, and in the North Sea. Its competitors, meanwhile, were struck by a string of surprising misfortunes. Their key negotiators had accidents, their directors developed mental health problems, 
and the lawyers would cave in suddenly, agreeing to disadvantageous settlements. No public or private investigation managed to pin a criminal charge on the Morton Group. The family's fortune was known to be huge, however no one knew how huge. Gibson around 1900. Samuel Gibson entered into Richard Morton's service on June the 20th, 1899. This brilliant student had a knack for deciphering ancient languages. It turned out that Morton had entrusted him with the translation of inscriptions on tablets found near the famous Iceman. Gibson's work led Richard Morton to Shadow Island. The fort that overlooks the island's bleak moors had been abandoned for a good two, 20 or so years. Soldiers stationed there had experienced hallucinations or suffered sudden bouts of sheer madness. Others simply disappeared without trace. I should also mention a strange legend that claims the chapel, situated near the fort, had been the site of strange rituals during the 17th century during which human sacrifices might have taken place. The state of Massachusetts needed no convincing when Richard Morton offered to buy Shadow Island, which he did for a nominal sum. It seems that to start with, Richard Morton wanted to make the fort his home. He spent a real fortune and superhuman effort on the task before abandoning the idea. He elected instead to build a strange manor on the south side of the island. His decision to buy Shadow Island and live there was because the engravings on the stone tablets were similar to those found in the island's deepest underground passageways. Letter from Gibson to his uh, fiancée, dated October 14th. Right, can't read that. As work on translations of the engravings advanced, relations between Morton and Gibson deteriorated. The student relished the romanticism of his work, whereas Morton seemed devoured by a destructive um, passion. What's more, Gibson's discoveries seemed to, to terrify him. He confided his worries and fears in a long letter addressed to his young fiancée, who had stayed on the mainland. This was the last that was heard of him. Gibson's mother later received this terse message. Your son has disappeared. His body has not been found. My condolences. Signed, Richard Morton. Okay, very suspicious. Search warrant for an unknown girl. The peak of Richard Morton's disturbing activity coincided with a wave of disappearances among the young girls of Boston's poorer neighborhoods. This is the most disturbing episode of his life. It is my definite belief that, driven by the evil Deserto, the founder of the Morton dynasty was practicing black magic rituals involving the sacrifice of innocent souls. Without doubt, in the very chapel, sacrifices had taken place three centuries earlier. To what end? I do not know. The first disappearances started in October, November. They continued with a frightening regularity of one a month, increasing during periods of equinox, until Richard Morton died on April the 13th, 1905. On this date, the disappearances mysteriously stopped. Archibald Morton. In 1874, Archibald Morton was born, the only child of Richard Morton and Susan Chalmers, the youngest daughter of Lord Chalmers. A ruined aristocrat and opium addict. While the Morton Oil Company's business prospered, Archibald devoted his youth to the study of the polar circles. Like his father, he mounted many expeditions. Like his father, he also developed a fascination for Shadow Island and its strange secrets. Okay, Polynesian men and women in the hold of a ship. It has slowly emerged that large numbers, young men and women, were uprooted from their distant homelands and taken to the island from as early as the end of 1905. Archibald was, in this matter, more discreet than his father. Evidence of this is found not only in the accounts of some sailors, but also in the written confessions of a slave trader, Thomas Plunkett, in which Deserto's name is cited several uh, times. It seems, however, that no trace of these unfortunate men and women has ever been found on this island. Okay. In 1897, Archibald Morton married his first wife, Jennifer Pritchett, a pastor's daughter and a renowned organist. She was a devout Christian and wrote long letters to her father recounting her disgust for her husband and her despair. The pastor, however, had disappeared the day after the marriage. The undelivered letters were kept in the postal archives where I discovered them still sealed. Archibald treated her with uncommon cruelty. She nevertheless gave birth to his son in 1899, Jeremy Morton. Jeremy was of a weak and delicate nature, but early in life he already showed signs of exceptional intelligence. He too was haunted by the secrets of Shadow Island, but this ge uh, general approach was more. Uh, but his general approach was more scientific. Jeremy Morton was an inventor. The breadth and originality of his inventions, which he never even bothered to patent, is highly impressive. He attended congresses and addressed conferences in 1922. He struck up a lasting friendship with one of the last descendants of the Abkhanis tribe, Joseph Edenshaw. The Native American settled on Shadow Island in 1924. Invoices from the Nobel Company, addressed to Jeremy Morton. Okay, explosives, so we've got some uh, weapons there. It appears that Jeremy Morton collected a considerable arsenal of weaponry. 
In less than three years, he ordered over 200 pounds of explosives from the Nobel Company in Boston, along with large quantities of phosphorus and magnesium. Okay, the last 10 years of Jeremy Morton's life were the most secretive and mysterious. In his youth and middle age, the inventor genius hobnobbed with the cream of society. He spent his old age, however, as a recluse on the island. Some accounts of this period make the blood run cold. One example is the marriage of his son, Howard, born in 1931 to Lucy Dogan, for which he staged a reception on the island. Relations and members from a distant uh, branch of the family were present. The party was disrupted by drama when the horrifically mut mutilated body of one of the guests was discovered in the park adjacent to the manor. Lucy's brother, uh, Michael Dogan, claims to have seen a terrifying lizard-like creature with tentacles armed with enormous fangs. The horribly mutilated body of one of the guests. There is no doubt in my mind that the members of the Morton family, Jeremy being no exception, undertook dangerous and frightful experiments on the corpses discovered by Richard and his successors. Experiments that interfere with nature's own course. Resurrections from the dead, crossbreeding, genetic manipulation. Yep, that seems like it. Lots of experiments there, and that's the, uh, the Morton family. Whew! Lot to read. That's a pretty big book. <laughs> I like um, going through the story, though, because uh, there's often clues in there as well. Um, there's something on this table, but I can't quite get to it. Maybe I need to look at it from this side. Hopefully this is not a really long book. Um, I'm a Morton. I realise that today I've tried for so long to escape my destiny. But my willpower was probably not strong enough. My fascination for the world of darkness has vanquished me. But I chose to resist. Cooperation, a choice my father never had because of that demon, Deserto. For I understood early on that only light can vanquish darkness. The magnesium bullets that were made in Italy have a remarkable effect on the smaller creatures, but they have proved inadequate to deal with the stronger monsters dwelling deep in the entrails of the night. The work of the French scientist de Broglo has greatly inspired my research. The, pro uh, the properties of light he discovered and its undulating nature are remarkable. It is thus possible to concentrate and amplify it to rupture its movement in phase and thus transform it into a terrible destructive energy. The information I possess about the molecular structure of the shadows of the night is fragmentary, but my study of them has produced conclusive results that their capacities for absorption of light energy are limited. Photoelectric energy at certain high levels destabilizes its chemical structure. The molecules break down and the entire macro system implodes. If I could build a weapon able to concentrate light energy by factors of up to 100 or even 1000, then, if I had the technology, if there weren't limits, God, if only someone could help me. When Edenshaw defeated Deserto, that malevolent being who led our family down the path to dishonor, I knew that my Indian friend had been sent to me by the gods. As a child, I saw him complete the incantation at the circle of stones facing in the direction of the conjunction. Deserto, who knew that power, employed his magical powers to, to dissimulate some of the statues from the eyes of man. This date will remain engraved on my memory forever. My grandchildren were born today. God alone knows what they will make of their lives. Howard wants to get them away from Shadow Island. I understand this. Re I understand his reasons, but I fear that destiny will prove stronger than a poor father's desire. My research advances in leaps and bounds. Time is of the essence. I feel things stirring down below like they know that a date with destiny is nigh. Their forays into our world of light are becoming increasingly frequent. With every new day, my study of the creatures of darkness greets me with new surprises, it seems that they all possess the same genetic heritage. The expression, however, is unsuitable. The entities are more closely related to minerals than organic life, but I find none better. It's as though they have all been cloned from the same root matter. I finally managed to strengthen the resonance power of the crystals. Now only matter stands in my way. I tested the first version of the photoelectric pulsar and it literally fell to pieces in my hands. I fear I must brace myself for long months of adjustment and careful tuning. Alan continues to show remarkable intuition. His mind seems to be perfectly in tune with the creatures of the night. He even claims that they obey his commands. However, I am unhappy with the direction his research is taking. My strength is abandoning me. Sharp pains shoot through my body like arrows. I have still so much left to do. I now know that Alan belongs to another world entirely. For the first time ever, he told me about his real plans. He wants to fuse light and dark to restore their original unity, to reunify them so defying their separation. I think he has been waiting for the moment when I am too weak and old to oppose him. God alone knows what he might do. For the first time in my life, last night, I prayed. Uh, this is Jeremy's uh, book here. Let's go to Jay. So he's the grandfather of Alan and Obed. Whew, well, there's quite a lot there. Um, so we're going to explore the rest of this library in the next episode. 
Uh, that's all for now. See you all again soon for more Alone in the Dark 4.